Hi, my name is Ben. We recently had some perfect neighbors move in. Everyone called them that way because they had an incredibly wonderful family. I swear, I'm not even exaggerating by a single gram. Well, you can see for yourself. I'll show you around. I was just going to visit there. Would you like to come with me? While getting ready, you can like the video and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to write your suggestions in the comments below. Do you see this average sized house with the greenest lawn on the whole street? Only our neighbors have such comfort and order. I like to visit them and admire it all. They're nice, at least I'm always welcome there. They feed me, take care of me, and sometimes give me money for nothing. Just don't tell my dad and mum, okay? When I knocked, Mr. Joe and his wife opened the door. Annie was sitting in the hall playing with her dog. They were strange couples. Their age difference was 20 years, or more correctly, she was 20 years younger than him. But I personally did not care about it. They moved here a couple of weeks ago. When my father saw how they had set up their house, he told me never to have any contact with them. But I did the opposite. Joe and I got along very well together, especially when my father was away. There was no connection between them or something like that. Mum and I thought Dad was just jealous. That's all. Hi, Ben. Come on in. I'm back. How are you? Annie and I just ordered dinner. What? Are these hamburgers? Double. Wow. I immediately sat down at the table and began to eat. Ben kept asking about me and if I had any friends. I said I could introduce them. The next day, I came in with Billy and Rita. They were delighted with our new neighbours too. Do you have any children? <clears throat> no, we don't have children. We can't have them, but we love children so much. That's why we moved here, because there are so many kids here. You can have a lot of fun in our house, right guys? We nodded and we were fed food again. During that month, we became very good friends. And then Joe and Annie told me that they had a great house in the country where we could enjoy the outdoors. My dad didn't want to let me go there, but my mum insisted. My parents let us go for the day. Joe prepared a barbecue and Annie organized great games. By evening, we were very tired. Annie bought us lemonade, which made us sleepy. It had been too much of a busy day. Annie made us hammocks and we fell into a deep sleep. I woke up to find myself riding in the car with Rita and Billy still asleep next to me. I asked where we were and Joe said we'd be home soon. I tried to get up, but I realized that my hands were tied and so were my feet. Joe, what are these ropes? Quiet, baby, or you'll wake the other kids. Get it off me, I said. Don't be rude to your mum, son. Mum? What are you talking about, Joe? Call me daddy. It'll make me feel better. Especially since we get along pretty well during all this time, right? What's going on here anyway? It's all right, son. We'll be home soon and go to bed. I knew that there was some kind of nightmare going on. I was scared and anxious. I tried to wake up Rita and Billy. I pushed Billy with my head and drool was coming out of his mouth. Ugh, the sight made me feel even worse. Suddenly, I noticed Rita was coming to her senses. She began to panic. Annie barely calmed her down and then Billy woke up. Joe told Annie that he should have given us more sleeping pills. We came to an unfamiliar house. Joe and Annie led us through the garage and into a room where there were three beds, two for boys and one for girls. They put us there and told us that we were their children now and that they were our new parents. Annie promised to be our best mother and Joe our best father. I said it was okay, but we already had our families, to which Joe said they wouldn't find us, even if they tried. And tomorrow morning, we were flying to another country with our private plane. But why do you need us? We can't have children and we can't adopt for some reason. And Joe and I are so eager to have children, we liked you right away. So we decided to pick you up. That's why you seem so perfect to us. But you're just nuts. Good night, kids. We have a busy day tomorrow. They untied our hands, kissed us goodnight, and locked the door. Rita started to get hysterical that it was all because of me and I introduced them to them. What are you talking about? I didn't hear you complain when Addie gave you money or gave you gifts. That's enough. We need to think about how to get out of here. I checked the windows, but there were bars. Suddenly, Rita took the hairpin off of her head and began to poke the lock. She managed to open the door. We waited until the lights went out in the next room and then went out quietly. 
We made our way to the exit, but the door was also locked there, and Rita managed to open it. As soon as we ran outside, the alarm went off. Joe and Annie came running out of their room. I saw the car keys on the table in the lobby, quickly grabbed them, and we ran in the direction of the car. No one knew how to drive, including me, but we locked the car from inside, and I started it. Joe begged me to stop and negotiate, but I stepped on the gas and drove down the street. Somehow I managed to turn on the headlights, and on the way, I hit several garbage cans. I didn't know where we were, so I just kept going. Suddenly, a car came at us. It hit ours, and we bumped into each other, and then I lost consciousness. We woke up in the same room, only this time tied up. Joe was sitting there with ice on his forehead. It was them. They crashed into us. Good thing no one was seriously hurt. Perfect couples were very angry, but they sounded like parents. You're grounded. A month without internet, TV and money. Do you understand? Asked Annie. They tied our hands to the bed so we wouldn't run away and left them. There wasn't much time before dawn, so I suggested a plan to the guys. Joe and Annie slept in, waking up only in time for lunch. When they came into our room, we pretended to have just woken up, though we had been discussing a plan of action until the wee hours of the morning. Mummy, I need to go to the bathroom. What? Yes, son. Uh, of course, honey. Dad, I'm hungry. I need a shower. Sure, kids. Let's go have breakfast. They were both very happy when they heard what we called them. With all our strength, we hid our anxiety and turned on all the acting skills. We were released and we washed, changed our clothes and sat down to breakfast. Rita asked, Mum, what are your plans for today? And Annie said she wanted to continue our punishment and they were supposed to leave, but the plane is not ready yet. And since we are obediently behaving, we can play games and cook something together. After breakfast, we helped clean up. Then Rita asked Annie to do her hair. They went upstairs and Billy and I asked Joe to give us some chores and he took us to the garage to fix the car that was hit yesterday. We spent half the day acting like good kids while we explored the area. There were no people, no cars, no one else around. No one knows where we were at all. Then I gave the command to Billy, who nodded. I fell to the floor, tossing and turning, gasping for breath, convulsing. Billy ran up to me. Oh no, he's having a seizure. Where is his inhaler? Joe didn't know what to do. Then Rita and Annie came running and the adults began to panic. Oh no, he's dying. Where's his inhaler? Maybe they dropped it in the car. Mum, Dad, where's his inhaler? He's dying. Urgent, ambulance. But Joe refused to call and said he'd look in the car. When he got to the car, Billy blocked the car and Rita hit Annie on the head with a tool. She lost consciousness and fell. They got caught, we called the police and they traced our call and came to us. When Joe saw the police, he started saying that we attacked them and wanted to rob them. And in general, he does not know really who we are. But the police were already aware of the three missing teenagers because our parents were looking for us. When we were all taken to the police station, the police officer said that these two were registered in a mental hospital and had escaped from there a couple of months ago. Someone is sponsoring them and they will find out. And we were also told that two years ago, they lost three children, two boys and a girl, and on this basis, both went mad. Now it was clear why they played such perfect parents and why they were not allowed to adopt other children. But you cannot kidnap other people's children. My father reminded me a hundred times that he felt something was wrong. And I promised that I would never be so close to my adult neighbors again. Hello everyone, my name is Walker. I recently transferred from one school. It is not quite ordinary, you can even say not at all ordinary. And all because it's not for everyone, only for the chosen ones. Now I'll tell you more about how I got there and what I went through. But while you watch, listen, like the video, write comments under the video, and do not forget to subscribe to the channel. When I was 16, I went to a school for aspiring detectives. Yes, I combined my studies in parallel with the main one. I was interested in investigating crimes from childhood. Besides, I did quite well, so my parents also did not mind. Once, I even managed to solve a high-profile crime at school. The fact is that at one time, I heard that we were distributing drugs. This happens in many schools, but the drug that was distributed among us was not just pampering, it caused real hallucinations, after which students committed suicide. The games with death were too much advertised on the phone radio. The gossip and rumor about the drugs was embellished. The police came to us every day, led by the sheriff himself, but no one could find the dealer. 
Since no one but my parents knew that I attended detective school, I managed to infiltrate a group of high school students who were pushing dope right at parties. It was difficult, but I did it. I pretended to be one of their buyers and then took and took. They were wondering why I didn't take it as well as the others, and I said that I have immunity. Besides, I used the minimum dosage, and they seemed to believe me. I managed to earn the status of a regular customer. I told guys that my foster mother also drinks this stuff, and they easily believed it. And so, at one of the drug sales, they were hit by the cops. I was also taken away so that I would not stand out and arouse suspicion. Then, allegedly, I managed to get out of it, but they did not. They remained in prison, and the trials began. I pretended I'd never spoken to them, that's all. But the case was not brought to an end. We needed to find the source of the crime, and that is, the one who prepares all this and distributes it. The most interesting thing was that the dope was only sold in our school, which meant that there were few drugs and their production had only just begun. All I had to do was find this person. Then one day, I met another guy at school, pushing CPC-3, or so the drug was called. I bought it, and then I made an appointment to buy more, and they told me that CPC would be there tonight. I agreed and hit around the corner. I was planning on tracking down the couple who sold it to me. Immediately after school, they headed towards the outskirts of the city. It wasn't difficult to follow them, but as soon as I got even closer to the fence, the guards chased me away. Then I decided to go there under a different guise. I remembered that our director had connections there. I think a friend or a relative worked there. That's it. All I had to do was pretend to be bad. All children with a terrible psychological state were taken there. It was worth getting a certificate from a school psychologist. This place was called the second school, but once inside, it was more creepy than I'd imagined. My supposed uncontrolled outbursts of aggression were treated with sedatives. I pretended to drink them, and I secretly watched the locals. There I saw most of the guys from our school, including those who were drugged but survived. Something must have happened to their brains to be there. It wasn't easy for me there at first. The orderlies there were petty. It was not worth disobeying them once, because they immediately hit the kidneys with a baton, despite the fact that we were children and they did not feed us well there. At best, once a day, and sometimes completely forgot, but regularly gave pills, after which the violent became quiet and upside down. I never saw the director, but I planned to get to his office, and I did it last night. I somehow ran through the nurses, I managed to pick the lock and go inside. I was looking for a clue. Why were the dealers coming here? I accidentally bumped my folder on the table and documents with photos of those dealers, or rather all the dealers, and the arrested ones fell out. And then I saw other photos. These children were sitting in the ward. They were pumped with something. Then I realized that they were all being used here. Suddenly, the photo on the table caught my eye. Oh no. The director of the psych ward was our director's twin brother. Then there was a noise, and I abruptly hid under the table. Someone came in. Damn, I forgot to close the door again. So where is it? And here they are, said the voice, and picked up the documents from the floor. Then he called someone and said that the children were ready. It was time to let them out. As soon as he finished, he left the office. I hesitated for a moment and then I was going to run out and run to the police, but as soon as I went out the door, I was immediately stopped, pressed against the wall, and threatened. What were you doing in my office? The director shouted. I was confused, scared, and then I said that I had taken Sapisi and I felt uneasy. Ah, uh, you're on the pill. Go on, go back to your room. Your turn to sell is not yet here, he said to me, and let me go. Then I realized that he was pumping the kids luring them to him with his brother's help and making the kids free dealers. Well, the children who died were not his concern. I managed to run out of the school by a miracle. The first thing I did was run to my office and I told my mentors everything. And with them, I went to the police, where we drew up a search warrant. The management of the two schools were caught red-handed and the crime was solved. It turns out that they mixed psychotropic drugs and distributed them to school children, a vague business that failed miserably. Yes, I was proud of myself and the work I had done.
this proved once again that I chose the right profession. After it was all over, I continued my studies as before. Only now I felt a little calmer for myself and my friends. Then it turned out that our director and his brother were already involved in similar cases related to smuggling. Only they managed to get free, and then they changed their names and surnames. Well, now they're going to jail for a long time, that's for sure. That school for psychos was closed. It shouldn't have been there. But they made an excellent dance school out of it, and now you can get there completely legally and at will. Do you think we did the right thing?